Welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. This week we are back at the CIC. This is the final show there. We've got a huge array of guests again. We've got a huge array of topics. Because uh, it's in another language part of it, we've had to cut that bit out. And that's where a lot of the intros are done. So we're going to tell you who you're going to be hearing from and roughly the topics. You'll understand the topics when you actually hear them. So we don't need to really go into that too much. You're going to be starting off by hearing from none other than Shane Mahoney. Now, you heard from him in the first podcast we did from the CIC, and you will have also heard us talk about him probably quite consistently over the last 12 months. He is a guest that we will be having on in his own right at some point, hopefully in the near future. Uh, He's going to kick this uh, podcast off along with uh, Willie Pabst, who speaks just after him. And Willie owns the Sango Reserve in Zimbabwe, uh, which is the reserve I think I mentioned last time. He talks all about it on the show. Does he talk about it? So I I mentioned it last time, the big translocation of game from there to a reserve in Mozambique. But you're going to hear it from the man himself. I'm Uh, sorry, uh, Daryl, Shane's going to be talking about what? Yeah, so they they kick it off. You'll hear an intro from uh, two people from the CIC, and uh, they'll be talking about alienation of nature and education, just in case the first bit is kicked off, because uh, we've cut bits where audio is not great or uh, they're speaking in another language. Uh, Because, like we said before, if there's French listeners, we could have left all the French in, but the vast majority are not French listeners, so we have taken it out. Um, So, yeah, that's going to be kicking it off, and then we're going to be going to the roundtable debate, which Byron was in. Yeah, so this was the um, symposium prior to the start of the CIC General Assembly, where they invited a number of journalists from around the world to basically sit around a table and discuss the future of hunting and how we can communicate what hunting is and the management that ties to hunting better to the general public. We all know that we um, hunters get a very hard time and any time hunting is put into the management of land, that whole concept gets a very hard time as far as the media is concerned and from a public perception point of view it's not looked upon particularly favourably. Uh, So it wasn't just hunting journalists around the table, although it was weighted that way. There was uh, one journalist from the Guardian newspaper who you actually heard speak right at the end of the last podcast that we did on the CIC. His name is Jeremy. You'll see him uh, writing in the Guardian newspaper on environmental um, aspects around the globe. Uh, Great guy, really level-headed. Probably go and try and find some of his stuff online. I don't think you're going to be hearing from him so much today. Uh, But that was that was the gist of it. We were discussing what we have done in the past, where it's gone wrong, what we can do now, and what we can do going into the future to make sure that we're communicating the really great work that's done by hunters, hunting organisations, and with hunting as part of a management principle to the greater public. Uh, you will be hearing from um, uh, Jens Ulrich, who is a friend of mine. He's a Danish um, journalist. He is the editor of Hunter at Heart magazine, which you'll be able to find some material on on Facebook and online. And we're actually going to be working with him on quite a big film project over the next 12 months. You'll be hearing from journalists from Slovakia, um, Italy, Hungary. You'll also hear from uh, Nina Kruger, who is a a German uh, journalist and another friend of mine. Uh, We've done a little bit of work and filming work in the UK on... Uh, the conservation of waders with her. She, as well as being a hunter, is a biologist and she was on a podcast talking about chronic wasting disease uh, with the head of um, the department that looks after that in Norway probably almost a year ago now. Uh, And the other English-sounding person uh, that you'll hear from is Rob York and he is an independent commentator. He not only has articles published in the Shooting Times but you will also see him Uh, publishing blogs on the RSPB's website as well. So, like Byron said, uh, the the, the bulk of people are talking about what the hunting situation is in their country and how the public perceive it. And uh, it's kind of 
good to hear in a way that it's not a isolated thing just within the UK that there is a media bias or a public bias that has something against hunting it is all over the globe and you hear hear from uh, lots of journalists talking about this um and the final person we speak to barn is um you we're going to be hearing from david scallon he is an an irish man by birth uh, and he has a position within face and uh, I'm actually not quite sure what he's going to be talking about, but Daryl can tell. He's going to be talking about aviation flu. It's aviation flu? Avian flu. And how hunters help track it. Uh, he goes into a lot of detail about it, um, how it's spread, the disease itself. Uh, it's, you know, it's a, a little bit dry in places, but very informative. And it's something that's happening in the, the UK right now. Um, avi- avian flu is a serious problem that has wiped out a few pheasant farms down yeah, south. Yeah, there was, yeah, earlier in the year. So it's, it's definitely something to listen to because they talk about how it spreads. So if you are a gamekeeper or anything like that, it will give you a better understanding about the disease. So that's the lineup. That's what you're going to hear about. Uh, we don't have a competition winner to announce because we are actually recording this intro probably a week before the podcast is actually going to go out because we're away for the next week on the west coast so what we are going to do is uh, the weekend after the couple of days the weekend after this podcast comes out check it out on social media we will uh, we will tag the person as well since we're unable to mention who it is on the podcast but the prize up for grabs was a Hornady reloading manual, but not just any Hornady reloading manual, the very latest edition, uh, which only came out uh, in this country a few months back. I I picked it up straight from the distributor when I was down there. Um, So that's what you had a chance to win. You can um, see who the winner was on social media. Yeah, you can. Uh, With the show itself, Luckily, we recorded a large amount of this ourselves. The audio should be significantly better. Some of it we didn't record. Uh, Apologies for banging on tables and stuff like that. Completely unavoidable. Uh, People get very excited. Uh, But it should be good for good listening. But like I said, because we've had to cut out the other languages, uh, it kind of might just jump from one person to the other. But you you should get it. You should get it. uh, It's all interesting stuff. And uh, it'll certainly help. I think what's great here is that you can get informed opinion from around the globe. It's very rare that you get to speak to so many, hear from so many people in such a short space of time from so many different parts of the world. Uh, And that's what you're going to hear here. We also have running the competition to win a set of Game Fair tickets, which is for the Game Fair at Hatfield House, which is actually going to be like one day after this podcast comes out so again because we're recording this uh, prior to the actual release of the podcast i will be down there myself uh, and on the friday uh, well actually on the thursday uh, on our way back as soon as we get signal we'll put up who the winner is so that you can claim your tickets if you're going on friday Uh, But it should be good. Come and find me. Uh, I'm not around on the Friday. I'll be there quite late, but I will be there Saturday and Sunday, and I will be talking on the um, talk show host thing that Fieldsports Channel are doing uh, on the Saturday and on the Sunday. On the Saturday, it's going to be about our series Into the Wilderness, and on the Sunday, it is a panel debate about uh, the Scottish government and their impact on field sports. So you'll get to hear that show i'm going to try and record it yes we'll try and record that so everybody can uh, hear it we will as always be running another competition for this coming two weeks and quite amazingly for all the really cool things that we give away one of the biggest entrants we've had in recent times was for a set of hornady beer mugs (laughs) so that is what we're going to give away again a set of Hornady beer mugs for your bar or garden, yeah. whatever you want to use them for. Um, we will see the post up on social media, and you can enter by. I haven't even thought about this. <clears throat> um, I think we should just do a random name. You just have to comment. Yeah, so we'll put up the post and just tag a friend below. Yeah. Simple as that. Oh, then, or email us, podcast at paceproductionsuk.com for the people that do not have any social media. Just comment below. We'll put something on Instagram as well. 
and that's it. Uh, don't forget that this podcast is supported by the Scottish Association for Country Sports. Uh, they have a really nice revamped website, so go and check out them. Just Google the Scottish Association for Country Sports. It'll be the first thing that comes up. And go and check them out if you don't know what they're around. And if you're not a member of a hunting, fishing, field sports organization, we urge you to do it because they are the very people who fight the good fight behind the scenes to make sure that we can carry on doing what we're doing and you should be a member they're a great place to start so go and check them out oh and uh, on other news we have our hour-long show of from norway out yeah we do so uh you a lot of our listeners will have heard us talk about the film that we have uh that we made for film festivals called in search of reverence if you didn't listen right to the end of the last podcast then you won't know that it actually made the hunting film tour in the states so it's going to be touring around loads of places in the united states and canada over the next 12 months uh, just visit the hunting film tour and you'll get all of the dates and locations and you will be able to see the film festival film there but like daryl said we have just released the hour-long behind the scenes making of and it's had a, a remarkably quick uptake a lot of people have watched it despite being an hour long yeah they have. I was going to say one other thing. We have, we've had a few emails recently of people that have kind of started listening to our show that, you know, they've just found it and they started from number one and now they're at like number 45 or 50 and they're still trying to catch up and they're really angry that they've missed all the competitions. If you are a new listener and you've just started this this podcast, just skip to the first, like the, the earliest one. Yeah. Enter the show and then go back. And then go, yeah, that's a really good yeah. point, actually. Uh, we also, I should say, that uh, we now only have one space left for our wilderness hunts in January. Yeah, as soon as we put it up on the podcast, it got snapped up. Yeah, uh. so one space left. Uh, there is a maximum of four people that come on any one of those hunts, and we're going to be hunting in the Highlands of Scotland. Uh, go and check out thepacebrothers.com, hit the tab wilderness hunts, and you'll be able to read all about it. Uh, all about it. Uh, the price is there, plus pictures from the last trip. One space left for the season. So I don't want to take the time more because we are running out of time. So I would like to ask uh, Mr. Margescu to introduce this topic. Why is it important for the CIC? Why we are here? And uh, why is it important that you are informed about that? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Gabriella. Also from my side, a heartily welcome uh, to everybody. Um, I just would like to uh, recognize um, uh, as, as a guest and observer in this press conference, uh, Marco Lambertini, Director General from WWF, who is not part of the press conference itself, but he expressed the desire to just be present. And uh, also the President of the CIC, George Aman, here, uh, George, if you can just uh, stand up for a moment. Uh, and uh, we are very pleased uh, to have you here, as numerous as you uh, appeared. Two subjects, as Gabriela mentioned, alienation of nature, and there will be this morning a panel related to this subject. Uh, quite an interesting panel, because it's not going to communicate just to the inside, but it will be a controversial discussion, which hopefully will be also constructive. Uh, just um, an example I mentioned uh, 10 minutes before at the briefing of the speakers of this morning. In my own country, in Hungary, we have some wonderful forest schools which are being run by the forestry enterprises in Hungary, where children can spend uh, up to one week uh, with their teachers and they're being taught on issues of related to nature. Um, and a busload of uh, children arrived in the forest. And what children do after they sit for two hours on a bus, they swarm out into the forest. And guess what they were looking for? They were looking in the middle of the Hungarian forest for giraffes and monkeys. Ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, what we are facing at the moment. Uh, that our children are not in the position to really um, know about their own surroundings sufficiently and they are not connected to nature <clears throat> as such, but they are connected to a, a virtual nature which is not their own surrounding. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, 
This will be the discussion also in this panel, and we are looking forward to engaging um, with uh, our speakers. Uh, there will be hopefully a connection uh, with the United States um, to a um, gentleman who created the expression of nature deficiency disorder. Ladies and gentlemen, that's uh, basically saying that we have an illness among our children, uh, which is the nature deficiency disorder. And that's something which I think is a quite serious uh, finding. And we're looking forward to hear more about that subject. The CIC has, uh, um, on Saturday afternoon, the task also to engage uh, with its membership and to have a recommendation uh, agreed upon by the membership in relation to what to do on how to tackle this situation from our side. And uh, our declared desire will be, if this recommendation goes through, that we intend to work with our national delegations uh, in order to be uh, contacting the <laughs> ministries of education in the different countries and the governments to see that the sustainable use of nature, which is one of the pillars of conservation itself, is being part of the education of children, is part of the official education curricula in the, in the countries. It's not enough to leave it on a voluntary basis to the schools and to the teachers. It needs to be prescribed. Because children nowadays, they don't understand the concept of where their food is coming from. They don't know how some of the animals are looking like which they may be having on their daily uh, plates at home. These are things which we need to change in order to be getting closer to nature. So that's one of the subjects. And Gabriela, do you want me to introduce this, uh, the second subject as well? Uh, no, I think we thank should just... You. Uh, uh, thank you, Tomasz. Yes, this is exactly what describes we are working on now. Uh, that this is very important for the CIC, that we are trying to educate people when they are young. We are tackling schools. Um, most, most, in most of the countries, um, we have the Young Opinion section of the CIC, and they are already organizing events for uh, children, uh, information days, when they are going out to the forest, uh, they are uh, getting to know a little bit of what is hunting, what is nature, uh, why conservation is important. And if I'm, talk about, I'm talking now about conservation, um, I would like to ask you, Shane, because I know that you are involved in uh, conservation deeply, working for uh, so many international organizations. Like, could you please say a few words? Why is it important? Yes, <clears throat> and I thank you all for the opportunity to say something on this topic. It is, I believe, the inalienable right of every child to have the opportunity to engage in a natural world that is healthy and sustaining and vibrant. Throughout our history as a species, we have taken an extraordinary array of inspirations from nature, as well as proven ourselves, even at this time in human history, to be inextricably tied to it in a very fundamental way. There is this right, of course, for human beings to have the opportunity to engage, but there is also clearly a responsibility on the part of every human being to play a role in the conservation of the natural world, regardless of race, or religion, nationality. There is really only way to bring, only one way, to bring this extraordinarily complicated issue of conservation to the people, to the masses of the public. And that is through the instruments <clears throat> of education. True, the direct engagement 
in the natural world is something we aspire for all people. But we have 7.2 billion of us. We are on our way to 8 and 9 and 10. Mm. And the opportunity for every single child, every single human being, to engage directly in the natural world will be complex, challenging, very difficult. So the idea that we mobilize at a very early age the knowledge that is required for people to understand how complicated the world of conservation is, intersecting politics and economics and cultural norms and dynamics. This is, a, this is an incredible challenge and we cannot begin it when a person is 25 or 30 or 40 or 50. And it is for this reason, these many reasons, that integrating conservation education at the very earliest stages in the learning development of young people, why that is absolutely so essential. There is no other instrument beyond the institutions of education that can replace that mechanism, that, that requirement, and the, and, the, and, the, and the means by which we would do this. And finally, I would say, the world is rapidly coming to a position on conservation where it is beginning to believe in the simplistic solutions offered by various ideological positions around the particular issue of the use of nature. And I can assure you that from a global perspective, the issue is anything but simple. It is incredibly complex and one that demands the very best of us and the very best of human beings has been proven for a long time now to be emancipated and elaborated by what we call education. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Schwab, do you have anything to add to this? Well, I have to add a bit. I also wish to uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. But uh, to Sean's comments, uh, it's not just the children that are the problem, it's the adults, it's the parents as well, because uh, how should the children know or get involved in nature when the parents are already far away, removed from it? So adult education is just as important. And if I may also, in the sense of just adding to uh, what you say, you mentioned the um, complexity and the point there is, it's not alienation from nature what we're talking about really, because we can't be alienated from nature, we can't opt out of reality of the, from the basis of, of our life. We are integral part of nature, we can't be alienated from it in a, in a strict sense, but what we can be alienated from is the processes of nature, what happens out there. And uh, alienation is about alienation from the processes of nature because people don't understand anymore what's going on out there. And the causes for that alienation, they're in my view threefold, you, you sort of hinted at them. Uh, I would say it's the bambification of nature. <clears throat> Two, it's the animal rights movement, subtitle education. And third, it's a sanitized nature. And uh, if I may uh, just briefly explain what I mean by that. Um, you see, people love these documentary films, spe spectacular films about, well, wherever, Africa, Asia, South America, and you see a predator chasing its prey, a cheetah, a lion, uh, an antelope, and people enjoy, really enjoy seeing that chase. But, here is the big but, but they don't want to know what happens after the chase. They don't want to know about the gory detail. They don't want to see that animals, the prey gets eaten alive by lions, wolves, uh, whatever. So they, they sort of, um, they want a clean picture of nature and they don't want to admit that it is red, 
in tooth and claw. And why is that? You see, if they don't want to admit that, it just shows that they, don't, that they haven't understood the most basic process of all, eat or be eaten. And they don't want to know about that because if they would acknowledge it or think about it, they would have to come to terms with their own mortality. So what they're afraid of is really reality of nature and the basic law of nature is eat or be eaten and all life depends on the death of other life for its survival and well-being and that's hard to acknowledge in a world where the milk and the meat comes from the supermarket. That's a short take uh, on that. So I'm not the only speaker here. I leave it <laughs> there. And there are things we can do about, but uh, maybe about that later. Thank you very much. And I would like to welcome Mr. Schiedrich. <laughs> um, from the Federal Office of Environment. Would you like to add anything to our first topic, which is um, about the recommendation, education, and alienation of people from nature? Okay, so um, we will come back to that, but I would like to give the floor to uh, Willy Pabst. Uh, could you please, Willy, really introduce uh, your topic and uh, why is it important? And then I will ask Mr. Shoko uh, to say a few words representing Zimbabwe. Yeah, I'll do that. It was a pleasure. Some of you have heard me once or twice yesterday. Um, <laughs> But I believe, personally believe the story we have to tell is so exciting, I can't stop talking about it. Um, Shane, just a quick question, a quick point before I go into my topic. Uh, I totally agree with what you, what you two gentlemen have said. My problem is, how do we make nature available for people to acquaint themselves with? My sons are unfortunate, they've got me. They've got Sango, they've got 60,000 hectares where they can learn to hunt and do and whatever it is, understand conservation. What about the other seven and a half billion people? How do they get to nature? And, and we, we live in Cape Town uh, most of the time, my wife is there, and, and we're amazed how in that school in Cape Town, where we're living in a country where I think it's about 15 or 18 percent of the country's land mass is under wildlife, these guys have never seen a lion, they haven't seen an elephant, they don't know. They are preaching um, um, born free nonsense um, because they're getting it from the media, certainly none, no reality. How do we get reality to these people? They need to be exposed and I don't know how to do that, I really don't. It's, it's too much of a topic, perhaps, to prescribe all the means by which it can be done, but one of the salient points I was trying to make is that the idea that every child is going to be brought to a deeper understanding, or every person is going to be brought to a deeper understanding of nature and its processes by actually engaging in nature, do we really think that that's a realistic option for eight, nine, ten billion people? No. So, uh, that, you know. Unfortunately not. It's, uh, anyway, I, I, you know, um, there's a huge question mark, a lot of work we have to do. Um, we, um, I invested in the Savi Valley Conservancy in a place called Sango in 1992 in Zimbabwe. Um, uh, I am one of the largest landowners there, and, and the reason why I'm saying it is not to brag and tell you what, what my assets are, <laughs> not at all. It is the other, the, the, other, the other part of the equation that I'd like to bring across is Zimbabwe has this reputation that I don't want to repeat to you what it's like. Um, it is not true in a lot of cases. If I, as a foreigner, if I'm clearly not an African, can own such a large piece of land, and enjoy the benefits thereof, then there must be a lot of things that are also right in that country, and I'd like people to address that and take note of it. Um, we uh, have, since 1992, added to it, we now have 60,000 hectares or 140... 2,000 acres, which is a large piece of land by any European standards. By African standards, it's big, but you need it because we've got all these big elephants that are migrating, roaming around from dry areas to wet areas, from no food areas to food areas, etc. We have been so successful in managing our wildlife and funding it through largely 
I'd say to a 98% through sustainable hunting. It's the only way we can make money. We don't get tourism into our part of the world, not for the, la for, for the want of trying, that we now have too many animals. So I went to the minister uh, last year, and I said, we've got to do something. As it happens, I'm also the non-executive chair of the Peace Park Foundation for their European uh, efforts. Peace Park Foundation is the organization and out of Cape Town formed by Nelson Mandela, Prince Bernard of the Netherlands, and Anton Rupert, um, an industrialist in, in, in South Africa, all no longer with us, but a phenomenal vision of transfrontier conservation areas, which means we are, we are combining parks in South Africa, Mozambique and Zimbabwe into one huge park, allowing these animals to migrate. Migration allows them to escape from no food, drought areas into food and uh, 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 um, proper supply of water areas, etc. It allows us to stock more animals if you so well. Um, we um, have also revived Zinave, which is a national park totally destroyed through the civil war in Mozambique. And we at Sango um, are donating 2,000 Plains Game animals um, with the great support of uh, um, uh, the Ministry of Environment and, and the minister who unfortunately couldn't be here personally. Um, but uh, to me, this is such an extraordinary statement of saying sustainable use of wildlife creates excess animals that are repopulating a national park which humans have destroyed and it's being revived. I cannot think of anything that is a greater message towards saying sustainable use of wildlife is a conservation tool of note. And I'd like to see where those NGOs out there who are proposing to kill sustainable use or ban the importation of trophies into Europe or America or whatever it is, where they can come up with projects like we have. And what I do and what we do is a sample, an example of what happens in about 75% of all of our wildlife areas in Southern Africa. You take the sustainable use away, you kill all of those, period. So that is a, some, a, a, a donation um, capture. We'll start in the middle of June. We'll finish in about August. It's a massive operation with 200 buffaloes, uh, 50 elephants, and all the rest of it. You cannot imagine how challenging that is and how extraordinarily exciting that is. I, I will ha partly live there. I'm sure my wife will join me. She won't climb in the helicopter, but I will. Ex well, lots of fun. Ex excuse me to interrupt. Uh, I can see already that we have only uh, four minutes left because minute. we have to finish Go. 35. Sorry. No, I'm uh, done with my presentation. <laughs> <laughs>
of the population. I think all over the world, at least the Western world, they are not hunters and they are not anti-hunters. They are the gray mass in the middle. And we live in the democracies, so these are the people who decide our future. And, and this, 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 this has been not that difficult, actually, to, to, to get it out there in this manner. So the question to you is, do you have those facts on which you can write, or do you need more of these facts? Do you have a distribution channel presently with which you can get such facts, or would you say there is a need for all of us to dis for somebody to collect such facts on a regular basis and distribute it to us? I have the facts, but they are very, it takes me a long time to find them because I have to go and look in a lot of different places for the facts. Uh, I know of scientific researchers who has been trying to gain access to facts from hunting organizations all over. Facts on a very dry, high level. I know of, I know of mainstream media writers who knows nothing about hunting, who would like to gain access to facts on a mo more edible level for those guys. And we do not have a good and easily accessible information hub available. We need that. We need that very much. I mean, for, for somebody like me who's passionate about it, I can find those facts. I can hunt them down. Uh, but but, but it's, 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 painful. it's painful and, and the normal writer would give up a long time ago because he doesn't know what to look for. I read about why we hunt is a German book by Florian Asher, which is called uh, Hunting, Sex, and Animal Eating, and Eating Animals. It's really brilliant. And I, as a hunter, would not like to be considered as a hypocrite. I know, and I agree, Listen, but it's... But it's I do hunt. I, I hunt because I like it, and it's, and it's very, very pleasant. And I agree that hunting is very good for the wildlife. But this is not the white life that is my prime, uh, prime motivation, okay? And uh, last year, I, I got some pheasants, and I hung them uh, on my wall at my, uh, on my house just to cool them. And my neighbor came, why are you, why are you showing those dead animals? This is so um, abusing to us, offensive. And on the same day, she had her meat, for, for the, for of me. course, I know all these arguments, but you won't win this battle. You can take these pictures, but you shouldn't post them. No. You will lose. Be sure, because me media nowadays is superficial, and you won't change the whole media. I agree, but you will. We all will lose this um, kind of. Let's call it a media fight. That's your because opinion. I say we will lose if we, if, we, if we behave like hypocrites. This is a wrong path, I say. I, I don't think so, but I, I want, want one more thi uh, thing to say. Um, like Tatiana uh, said, she kind of was disappointed that no journalists or mainstream journalists came to a press conference. Journalists or bloggers or communicators or whatsoever, they are not interested in press conferences. It's, a, it's about stories. Um, and that's kind of very old-fashioned thinking to invite communicators to a press conference and then be disappointed if, some, if no one's coming. And another thought that came to my mind, I think it's really we have to differentiate between all those countries we're talking about, especially in Europe. For example, I think you, you can't compare like Poland. I think Poland has a, a rather in a positive way traditional approach, at least if you compare it to Germany or Austria. I think Switzerland is very different. And when, for example, I, I look at Instagram, hunt, hunting girls, like 18 year old hunting girls and boys from Scandinavia, they post on Instagram, they do things that in Germany or in Austria, I would not suggest any hunter to do so, because the public and the society is completely different. And when we talk about um, a small kind of influential elite that's 
anti-hunting, that's not what many, or what, what society, at least in Austria, is thinking about hunting. In Austria, and it's about prejudice, of course, but in Austria, the mainstream regards hunting as a cynical hobby of old, privileged men and a, and a rather right-wing elite. And that's what the average people in Austria think about. Of course, that's not the truth, but there's, it has, it's a certain truth, and hunting needs testimonials that don't fit to this prejudice. Yes, uh, you're right. Uh, we are in a war, in my opinion, we're at the beginning of it. And uh, so in, uh, and our enemies are not interested in game conservation, they want to change society. And we have to deal uh, with ideology, and therefore we have to go there where ideology starts and where it grows. And these are the big cities, this is the urban society. And the chance we have there, there are so many uninformed people. You have uh, at least, uh, there are a lot of uh, institutes that tell you, you have at least 30% of them. Uh, they will follow you if you give them the right emotion, the right facts, the right stories, the right way to communicate. And uh, I, by myself, I am since decades in the television business. I've worked uh, for big uh, companies uh, all over Europe and before I decided to make my own one and then, Today we have the chance of a completely change in the communication world and this is our chance as small interest groups and we have to learn how to make our own media because uh, it costs uh, a lot of energy and is not so much efficient just to move existing media. You can do it a little bit, you can do it beside, you can do it in the way just uh, uh, as you have to do it for serious information. But in reality, you have to tell the people how your story works and you have to develop your own media. And we did it with uh, Jagd Natur TV, we did it uh, as a, 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 a motion media, a, a film media, a television media, because it's much more efficient in an emotional way. You can, uh, you can bring the facts behind the stories, you can create your own formats, you can create your own news, you can, you, you can do it and you can afford it to do it, because this we demonstrated with the Act Naturtifa. And for example, uh, and it's easy, or not, uh, not too hard, yeah, to get the audience where the audience lived, and non the, not the hunters. So for example, we have collected uh, since uh, 1914, when we started, more than 1.6 uh, million unique clients, yeah? And you know, in the German-speaking countries, we have about 500,000, uh, all in all hunters, they have a hunting license. Okay, and I see your TV, so yeah. because I must admit I don't know it. So yeah. Uh, yeah. And we have, have a lot, yeah, and, and we go there where, where we can will uh, develop emotions. For example, we have, uh, we have a format, uh, what uh, non-hunters really want to know, yeah? That it's, it's a, a duel studio, for example, and we go there, for example, where, where, where real the emotions are. So we pick them out, we say, okay, you can tell all the arguments, then I have, for example, Alexander Schwab, uh, you know, uh, against, and he's argumenting against. It's like, a, and at the, at, at the end, you have a conclusion, and this conclusion is emotional, and has a lot of facts, and it works as a media format. But I thought yep. it approach you, uh, yep. Uh, yeah, because uh, the new media, the new media is earning the audience. For example, when you start today uh, building up your own media, you, uh, you get the audience through the new media and not through the linear media, how they say. Yeah, because uh, they are they have they are finished getting more and more audience. Yeah. Uh, and therefore you have the chance and we can demonstrate it. We have a lot of examples uh, we, can, we can demonstrate these effects. And, uh, and, and, and therefore I think you can build up your com community. Uh, you need agenda setting, communication uh, 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 setting and you have to learn how to make your themes and how to argument. And then uh, even the classical media is interested and will follow you. And we have, for example, in our discussion groups, we have no problems to get in all the hunting <coughs> enemies and so on, but we go into uh, a professional media setup 
where you feel, uh, as an, uh, uh, if, if, if you watch it, you see the arguments, you see the fight, you see the differences between, and you build up your own opinion. And therefore, I think uh, this chance is not used at all. When we started in Austria, for example, the, the traditional hunting organizations, they saw us and asked, who allowed you to do this? Yeah? Because they were against, because uh, they, they had the feeling to lose authority. Yeah? Today, we're in partnership, and so we have to learn. I think uh, we have a lot of uh, chances through the new media. We can do it in an international way. We can do it uh, through a lot of languages. Uh, but I think this is, for me, one of the key issues uh, we have to learn. Did you finance your operation? Uh, yeah, of course, we financed it as a media company at the beginning because we don't drive only this special interest channel, but I did it because I'm a hunter by myself and I saw the problems all over. And uh, now we have, uh, we have a media company, we have some uh, partners, and uh, of course we have partnerships because today we speak more about special interest relationship than about public relationship. Yeah? And therefore I think, but we do it in a way that's competent and uh, not in a way we just uh, tell the people what anybody wants us to do. Yeah? Because I think the key is uh, professional journalism and the professional setup. I would like to um, address the issue of getting our content out there. Um, and this doesn't just go for Scandinavia, this, this goes basically internationally. What I see, when I see positive hunting content in mainstream media, it's always passionate individuals who are more or less doing this in their spa spare time. Um, it's hardly ever stories driven by hunting organizations. Yeah. And we have a huge problem there because a passionate individual can only do so much on a non-existent budget. <coughs> the only thing that's keeping guys like Byron and girls like Nina and people like myself from jumping on an airplane when the next sizzle the line is shot and making ourselves available for CNN or our local news channels back home is money. I don't have the money for the plane ticket. Now this is, this is a really sad situation when you compare Europe to the US. Because my impression from all the uh, guys I know in this industry in the US is that if you are passionate about something in the United States, then you are willing to throw some money at it. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that nobody is throwing any money into this whole communication things. I, I know that we, we, we have the organizations, that's good, but the, the ones who drives the positive content that's actually out there are individuals. It's <coughs> private initiative. Maybe I can speak uh, about the Slovakia also for Vladimir, because yeah. he are from <laughs> yeah. one uh, very small country. Uh, so what I can say is that the, uh, the society in Slovakia is very polarized. There are people who agree with hunting or are hunters. There is approximately 60,000 of hunters in Slovakia registered, because everybody must be registered in Slo Slovak Hunter cham Chamber like mm -hmm. organization. And uh, there are people who are uh, uh, opposed hunting at all. And uh, I can say that uh, people who are against the hunting usually are people from the cities, uh, sitting in cafes with no touch with the nature. So, but those people are very, uh, they, they like influence more the politics, I think. And uh, uh, maybe also there is a, uh, there is little guilt also on the hunters because we have several cases uh, which were uh, very, um, negatively resonated in the, uh, in the society. It was, for example, the hunters have a right to, to shoot uh, a dog when the dog enters uh, some certain places. And they did, they yeah. shoot it some, uh, it was several cases, but the, the, uh, the people were really against this and it was really, it were really uh, big cases that hunters did this. And, and these were also quarreling if the dogs were on certain of, the, of that places or not, if they will were with their owners or where, where the people were. Then people sometimes uh, feel that they cannot go walk to the wood because they can be 
killed by hunter and uh, we have a lot of this discussion now and what i see as a problem is the that the chamber of hunters they never communicate then if these negative causes happen and people ask for explanation maybe they expect that this organization will do something because the hunters are members of it so maybe the organization will will tell okay we will investigate this and we will give some solutions and maybe we will make some um, not punishment, but something. We will have some some our uh, steps what to do with with the hunters who maybe did some mistake. But this never happened. They never communicate with the public, and maybe uh, it should be not their own media because I think there are uh, speciali specialized media of hunters, but uh, media of uh, of this uh, fact information and uh, uh, with the. No it's some, uh, some people who, who will speak with the public about these uh, events, also if something negative happened. Um, and uh, now maybe the, the positive about the hunting. Uh, I, I mentioned the case of, uh, of eagle hunters. Uh, it's a very strange case now because uh, uh, eagle hunting is on the UNESCO heritage list. Maybe you know about it. And the Slovakia was among the first yeah. countries which entered the process and uh, prepared for, 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 for this. And uh, uh, it was maybe 13 years ago when it started to get with Arab countries and uh, I don't know, maybe 14 world countries were uh, yes. uh, joined to, to prepare all the documents and uh, things. And uh, till now Slovakia is not in UNESCO heritage list because our national UNESCO committee just refuses to, to, uh, to write us there. They always stop our nomination, nomination of people, of that eagle hunters who really worked hard to, to get there. And they just stop it because of some personal feelings about it. And there is no, you cannot appeal anywhere. It's, uh, there is no so body which can YouTube. decide. Just this one national UNESCO committee. So uh, we have the last chance this year to, uh, to be recognized and uh, uh, the, uh, those people are not really thinking they will be because they know that they are always refused by the National UNESCO Committee. And uh, that's maybe because of this, uh, some negative feelings toward the hunting community in Slovakia. And interesting is interesting is that Slovakia have uh, only one only one school for eagle, eagle hunting in have a word we have we have základná uh, škola basic school and 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 uh, we have hours in basic schools and and uh, we have also secondary, secondary school, school for yeah. for uh, forestry and hunting and they can uh, learn eagle hunting or, or Um, in Italy, we have about 750,000 uh, hunters, so that's about one in whole of Italy. Yes, so that's about uh, one percent um, of the population. And yes, a great job is doing Sky Italia TV with uh, Mr. Bruno Modugno. Um, Sky Italia is uh, producing hunting films, and these films are showing. Um, how sustainable hunting works and that uh, sustainable hunting is um, important for wildlife conservants. And I have to say that we are in the unlucky sit situation that most of the medias are against hunting. That's uh, that, uh, for the national context. Um, in the north of Italy, in the extreme north, as I, as I have said before, in South Tyrol, there's the difference between Italian and German medias. Um, with, the, with most of the local German medias, we have got uh, a good relation. For example, last year, we uh, published together with the most uh, representative German uh, newspaper about uh, 100,000 copies of this uh, nice magazine about uh, hunting and biodiversity. And I can, uh, you can let it go there. And yes, the situation is quite difficult. We are um, <laughs> fighting every day. And another problem is that um, the um, people who are against hunting are quite strong. They have a very strong lobby in Italy and also in Parliament. They have a lot of supporters. Um, I'm follow, following the, um, nearly every day the debates in Parliament 
and you can always find something um, which was brought into parliament by um, anti-hunting uh, lobbyists and the hunting lobby is very, very um, yeah, small. Well, um, what I experienced in Hungary, we also have this, uh, well, so-called hate from the public, and which I think, and I'm sorry to say that, that comes from the people's uh, stupidity. Um, well, a hundred years ago, I think uh, almost everyone knew what hunting was, but now uh, people tend to forget it. And what I see is, back in Hungary, no one knows, uh, closely not nature is, but if we talk about hunting, it's even worse. They do not know it. So uh, with my colleagues, we try to, I don't know, try to forget about adults. Uh, they are cursed, let them go, they will not change. So we try to make uh, a series for kids. Working together with the uh, Ministry of Agriculture, we made a series for kids. Uh, these are short one minute uh, well, videos, and each video we try to answer one question. And uh, we went back to the basics, so questions like, who are hunters? How can uh, professional hunters serve nature and animals? And so on. Uh, but the results of this will be in the future. Uh, we expect uh, the things to change, to get better, because by giving knowledge to the next generation, probably that can change it. I don't know. I, I don't have much new to say. Most of that would be just a copy of what's, what Jens said. Um, our association is not doing much. And what they are doing is mostly uh, negative. I mean, uh, s speaking about lawsuits for uh, the, the fake news and stuff, but they are not doing um, much positive. That's the problem. The, I remember a very famous Polish food enthusiast who once, once said on the national television, uh, people, we should love hunters, they bring the best food, they bring the, they bring the best meat. And I think with that sentence he made, he did more than the association in the history. That's the problem. And I think that uh, what you said, transparency, being honest, uh, being aware of our motivation, and uh, and showing hunting as a as a lifestyle, co coherent lifestyle, is the key. Thank you. Yeah, I'm being one of the last speakers in the list. Um, I don't have um, much new to add, but I wanted. What I wanted to say is that we kept complaining how unfair hunters are treated by mainstream media and that the hunting lobby is very strong and that their strong point is unity. Um, and you might be right that we are at war, at, we are at least struggling, but should we be at war in Africa? I'm writing about red deer stack antler development, I'm writing about wild boar management on our doorstep. This is what the hunters, I right for are interest, interested. If we want unity from them, we can't expect them to be interested in what is happening in Africa. It is interesting, it is very important, but this is not the point that we should, or that at least in Germany is very interesting for the people. Because going to Africa is a once in a lifetime experience for 99.9% .9 of the hunters. Um, it's not part of their everyday life. It might be interesting for some with very exciting lives, but for the normal average hunter, it is not really relevant. So we keep on discussing topics like Cecil, we give it a lot of room, even we give it a lot of room in Germany, in Europe, even though it doesn't really um, matter to us, to our everyday lives. Where, while we are fighting in Africa, we are losing ground every day at our doorstep. We are losing the battle at home while we are fighting abroad. This is one of the main problems why I see the hunting community in Europe not as a unity. Because we are fighting wars everywhere else but not at home. This is my 
opinion of one of the huge problems that we have. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, obviously quite hard to add something. There was a guy in, in Britain a few hundred years ago called King Canute, and he tried to fight a battle when he tried to stop the sea coming in, but he kind of failed. So I would agree there are certain battles that we, I think we should not fight and focus on the stuff that does matter. There's, urbanization is with us, but that's not the same as having a discussion saying them and us, rural and urban. They are two completely separate issues. The urbanization is all about consumption, about agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the other one is a very divisive thing. We've got to be very careful about the use of our language. I'll just wrap up on, I chaired a debate um, on pollinators. So the government in the UK have a pollinators a strategy panel and it's all about bees and the effect on them from pesticides. And everyone was in the room and I would, was chairing it and I suddenly said, right, everyone's going to talk but they're not going to say where they're from. So everyone gave their expertise but no one had really any idea where they were from. So no one could build up a prejudice as soon as they opened their mouth. And so by the end of the meeting we'd had fantastic stuff. Only afterwards did we discover that the agri-chemical people were talking incredible stuff about pollinators. But no one ever knew about that, because as soon as they had done, the whole meeting would have been a waste of time. The subtleties of social science, we are missing them in order to have a much more nuanced discussion. Um, and I think we'll have many more discussions. I would say that there's some good stuff here, but these are baby steps at the start. We're starting the dialogue with ourselves before we can have an external <clears> dialogue. So I don't think there's a big rush to be ambitious about these are the results of this particular meeting. Positive, but small steps. As I said before, I'm, um, I was active in the anti-hunting uh, groups before I was hunter. Believe me, those people are nothing and they are nobody. And we are spending hours and hours speaking about them. I think we should rather spend the time to be better than them first and to focus on what uh, Jens said. You said 80% of the population is neutral. I would rather say 80, uh, 98% of the population. So we should focus on those people <coughs> and not on the 0.2% of anti-hunting uh, people because they are really nothing. And just a question I would like to ask you. Who is in contact with your local CIC delegation? I don't know anybody from CIC in France. Uh, in the UK, as I guess is probably true in most of your country, your respective <coughs> countries, is that in terms of the, the communication, there's a massive disconnect from the general public of how they understand the world. We've become very disconnected from even you know, our basic food from an agricultural standpoint. And the, the example that Jens gave uh, at the start of focusing on a person is more to do with the, how it being relatable, in my opinion, rather than the emotion of it. You can relate to that person. Just the same as if we ignore trophy hunting for a moment because we've, there's lots of economic justifications that I'm sure we all know, but hunting for purposes of meat, we can relate that to farming. Most people have no problem with farming, with, the ex with small exceptions like battery farming. Most people can understand that. So if we can relate that to things that people are, are already understand, then I think we'll go a, a long way along the road. Um, I'll go through as quick as I can. Hunting slash poaching as a language, we probably see that in all of our countries where the media mix up the word hunting and poaching. They're two different things. We need to be active at picking up every single media agency who does it. I do it. Every time I see it, I pick up the phone and I call them or I write them a letter. We should all be doing it. And every single hunter in every single country should be doing it. Because if enough people speak, then they'll listen. They'll change the language, because they don't want to take phone calls and a million emails. <clears throat> we in the UK have allowed, for some reason, history to be written on, rewritten on a number of uh, occasions, and we have never seemed to tackle the problem. One thing that we see, and I'm sure Rob will agree with me, is that it seems to be this misconception that uh, driven grouse shooters drained all the grouse moors. Well, it couldn't be further from the truth. That was to do with uh, government policy in the 1970s, which was to do with agriculture. The same with deforestation. Deforestation on the heather moors we have now has nothing to do with driven grouse, it's to do with sheep. 
we as the hunting communities need to step in when the, these things are mentioned, even though even if they're not quite directly related to a, our current activities, and just correct that rewriting of history, which puts paints us in a very bad light. <clears throat> Nina's the only one that's mentioned the focus on Africa, and I'll, I'll just pick that up because I love Africa. Both my parents are from formerly Rhodesia. My grandparents live in South, in South Africa. I've got friends in Zimbabwe. I hunt there every year. However, I think what Nina says is correct in that we need to make sure that that is not the over-dominating focus of all of our discussions. I, I am guilty of that myself. I have far more knowledge about the conservation um, efforts and anti-poaching efforts of going on in Africa than I probably do in Europe, and that's bad on my behalf but, because I have a fascination there. But we, as a group of people, and especially the bodies, because they're particularly guilty of it, we need to make sure that we tell the stories that are close to home and the ones away from home. But I do disagree that we shouldn't be concerned with it, because I think that no, we I have... Said that we should not be concerned. No, but, okay, well, I should just reinforce the point that I think that we need to make sure that, as hunters, we have a global view of conservation, which would include Africa, but we need to emphasise the stuff at home as well. Um, and just lastly, we have a media bias, and I think that... Uh, one of the ways that we are starting to successfully tackle that in the UK, and I can give uh, two examples that have worked in the recent weeks, is, as I mentioned, I, I'm also a filmmaker and I've been doing some stuff with different organisations, and we've been tackling it slightly differently. One example is a film that was just made recently about the demise of sea trout on the west coast of Scotland. The demise is a result of uh, fish farms being put in inappropriate places from decades ago. Now, if, that, if the film that we had made on that had been approached from the basis of we are fishermen, we like catching fish in the river, and you've spoiled our sport, no one would have listened to that story. We didn't take that approach at all. We took the approach of the wild fish as an iconic species that is now no longer there. That has been showed on... Uh, it's had massive social media uh, success. It's been, it was picked up as a result of that by BT, and this weekend it goes on Country File, probably one of the most biased things on the BBC in this country. Now, the fishermen will get benefit from that as this story goes out, but that was never the focus. We've done exactly the same thing. It's not out yet with fox hunting in the UK, probably one of our most controversial subjects. Putting a film together right now, the focus is not on the hunting. It's on the farmers. It's on the farmers in the borders areas of Scotland that rely on hounds coming in, especially right now during spring, when they're losing one, two, a dozen, 20 lambs in a night. And in one day, hounds can come in and remove that problem fox from the field that it was in. Explain that to the public, and they might be on side. If we had tackled that issue, well, if we had tackled it, like I say, the film's not out yet. If we had tackled that issue from all the other standpoints, like the, the Countryside Alliance have been doing for decades and has never worked, we would have, it, it would have never worked, and it would gain no traction. That's all I have to say on that. Um, as speaking f for um, Belgium, I think we also, I think it mentioned by one of those, that we have to get rid of our, of our uh, so-called elite old man group and try to go back to like a farmer who's hunting, stalking, shooting, uh, normal people too, not everybody goes to Africa or Siberia or Alaska. Um, so that will gain us also, I think, lots more credibility in the end. Also, from Belgium side of view, I mean, we have to keep focusing on giving our new hunters like a good scientific or semi-scientific base. So if they if they get questions, at least they can ask in Absolutely. a decent manner. And I'll say, I hunt because I like it. Yeah, okay, but you have to give more arguments and not only the food because you you can't you can't provide raw deer to nourish the whole Brussels day after day. So, I mean, that's, that's a small topic you can put into the, conver to the debate. But I think like uh, also uh, on every, every level, I think also in, in Germany, they had a, a good like hunting license system. But if you can buy your hunting license nowadays by paying a lot of money into one of those push hunting schools, I don't think they are like, like really, I, some maybe yes, some probably maybe no but i think like uh we have to every one of us 
have to if we get some nasty questions i think we have to give them like a good answer yep. take time to say why we hunt how we do it of course there are some idiots in every level of society but i think um, we have to start with ourselves and try to work from from the base on also and then also yeah, what's mentioned we have to try try to find some international european body who can collect a bit every scientific reports and transfer to us and hunting organizations and, and whatever fine thank you very much thank you very much for everybody for everybody we have a coffee break about 10 minutes Thank you very much, and uh, just thank you to CIC for inviting FACE to be part of this discussion. Um, I'm conscious of time, and I also think we've had some excellent presentations, and it would be useful to get some, uh, uh, from, some feedback from the floor, so I will try to get through this in uh, less than 10 minutes. Um, most of you will be familiar with FACE, the European Federation for Hunting and Conservation, uh, founded in 1977 mainly uh, due to the uh, development of the EU Birds Directive. Uh, we have 36 members, uh, including all of the EU 28. Uh, we've been an IUCN member since 1987. Uh, we're Brussels-based with the Secretariat of about uh, 10 to 12 uh, staff. And we're representing uh, 7 million hunters in Europe on multiple issues. Uh, and we have a very good working relationship with CIC in particular on migratory birds and on uh, animal health, for example, with avian flu, African swine free fever and wild boar, um, etc. So I'm going to approach uh, the topic of avian flu, uh, in particular with reference to uh, the recent winter. Uh, I'm not approaching this from a veterinarian perspective, but more from uh, my own background in conservation policy and science, but really how avian flu affected hunting. Uh, some of the proposals that were made in specific countries uh, and what we can do in the future in terms of recommendations. Um, I want to briefly uh, give some background on avi avian influenza. Um, some of you will know this, uh, mainly spread through feces, so uh, very much adapted to water for transmission, so very much uh, uh, can, can affect migratory waders and water birds. These can carry the low pathogenic uh, avi avian influenza as uh, uh, what we use the term as a reservoir. Uh, the mutations to uh, the highly pathogenic avian flu uh, mainly occur with reference to uh, poultry. Uh, this is a notifiable disease and there are huge economic implications uh, associated with this, um, not only um, issues relating to wild bird conservation, but mainly to the poultry industry. Um, uh, also, it's a zoontic disease, uh, which means it can be spread from animals to humans. Very briefly, you see the main categories um, in terms of the impacts. Uh, domestic animal health, um, big impact uh, in terms of economies around the poultry industry. Uh, human health as well, I'll discuss this briefly, and wildlife health in terms of consequences uh, to conservation and various activities, including hunting. Uh, briefly, the poultry industry, uh, we see major implications. Billions of chickens um, uh, are, are killed as part of disease control programs, and there are millions spent uh, on these programs. Uh, human cases, uh, it's quite interesting. Um, all of these have been linked to poultry exposure, uh, I think with the exception of one case, and these mainly relate to uh, biosecurity issues uh, around the poultry sector, and you can see the origins in, uh, in, in a lot of the developing countries. Uh, the typical scenario is for this to spread from Asia to Europe. Here's a, a little simulation on what happened, uh, H5N1, uh, and how it spread uh, from, from, from the east into Europe. How is the infection being spread? Wild migratory birds are frequently referenced, uh, and this is very important. Uh, this map is often used, uh, and we would be quite critical of the use of this map. This shows all of the major flyways. Um, I will come back to this, but um, certainly wild migratory birds have been blamed um, uh, for the spread of this, yet there is very, very limited scientific consensus on this and on the role of migratory birds uh, in, in spreading avian influenza. 
Uh, we have we can make some assumptions based on some data. Uh, it's a case in 2005 in China regarding the spreading uh, of migratory birds. Um, if we look at this uh, at a more classical example uh, using Google Earth, uh, this is an assumption uh, of the spread of H5N1 uh, into Europe in 2005 and 2006. Uh, I will come back to this issue uh, a little bit later. Uh, and this H5N1, um, there were uh, multiple cases of dead wild birds in, uh, in, in, in 13 countries. Um, the main factor is the poultry industry, poultry production, poultry trade, uh, and live markets remain a problem. You can see these images here um, re regarding very poor uh, biosecurity standards, and this is really uh, a problematic area. And you can see even how, how poultry is, uh, is moved. This map is very interesting, and much more interesting than the flyway map of migratory birds. Uh, this shows the movement of poultry and poultry products around the world, and we're very familiar with this. Um, I'm from Ireland myself or, uh, or initially, and we're, we're moving lamb from Ireland to New Zealand and vice versa, and beef to Brazil and back. Um, there have been numerous outbreaks in wild birds. Um, uh, in the past, this was very much limited to poultry, so we have seen uh, uh, the, the highly pathogenic uh, avian influenza uh, develop that little bit and become more prevalent in, in wild birds. I won't go into this in too much detail, but there have been a number of cases in the past uh, of how avian influenza has affected wild birds in terms of mortality. Uh, importantly, the negative impacts indirectly uh, it's often been the case, and we see this with a lot of uh, animal diseases, that wild birds or wildlife is being blamed uh, without the proper evidence base. Uh, and as I said initially, the specific role of wild birds in, the ter in, in terms of long-distance transmission via migration, uh, if, if it exists and there is still some debate uh, about this, remains very much unclear. Uh, but there's multiple measures taken against wild birds, and sometimes their habitats. Uh, and you can see this. This isn't helped by, uh, by the media. Um, the ducks of death. This was in a, in a UK newspaper, very much blaming uh, migratory birds, ducks and geese, for causing the spread of avian influenza, where it's uh, uh, also some other examples. Uh, the consequences, um, you can get various discussions at various levels, local, regional, national levels, uh, sometimes at levels higher than that. Uh, about a range of, of, of what to restrict, what approaches to take. Uh, you've often heard uh, Colleen come into the question, you know, sometimes destruction of habitats. Uh, and in particular, what we're interested in is restrictions um, on hunting. Uh, so H5N8 uh, in the European Union, first detected in October in Hungary in, in a mute swan. Uh, and since then, the virus has been identified in a further 22 member states. Uh, so this was a big issue, uh, and a big issue for the poultry sector, uh, but also uh, a big issue for wild birds. You can see uh, uh, 17 cases uh, in, in poultry farms. Um, the virus is mainly detected uh, in, in swans, uh, water birds, duck species, seagulls, birds of prey. Uh, currently, the, 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 the findings of H5N8 uh, are declining. Um, and also, I won't go into this in too much detail, uh, there were two further strain, strains of highly uh, pathogenic avian influenza detected, H5N5 and more recently H5N6. Uh, this is one of the recent maps from the European Commission. Um, the Commission is very active on this uh, with a range of other partners, and you can see the main uh, infections related to poultry farms. I don't know how clear it is, some of the, uh, uh, the green stars related to wild birds. The Scientific Task Force uh, on Avian Influenza and uh, Wild Birds, this is very important, uh, and this is important between the relationship of FACE and CIC. You will see on the top, CIC is a member um, of this Scientific Task Force. And in December, uh, uh, FACE was providing some input into this. They had a very good statement, but we were concerned about some issues, in particular the use of the word disturbance. Um, uh, in the text uh, of, of the statement, the wording remained despite our concerns where, where, where they referred to disturbance of water birds 
uh, can lead to unforeseen movements of birds into other areas. Uh, and they, the reference was that such actions would contravene commitments made under international agreements and conventions. Uh, our, our main point here was actually, if you read the text of these conventions, it refers to significant disturbance for the conservation of populations. Um, so we were not happy with the link with disturbance here in reference to these international conventions. The Netherlands, I want to refer to three examples, uh, the Netherlands, Bulgaria, and Ireland, uh, where, where proposals were made that were initially very restrictive, uh, and then uh, following advice from, from different partners, um, there were more successful, more pragmatic outcomes. So in the Netherlands, there was initial, an initial proposal to ban all hunting uh, from the Ministry of Economic Affairs. Uh, this was due to disturbance, and this included hunting of other species, such as wild boar, and hair hunting. At the same time, they permitted other activities, for example, the use of gas bangers and other military activities that can disturb water birds. The Royal Dutch Hunting Association ap approached this very well. Um, they challenged this on several points. Uh, they refer to the in international context, so why are they the only country uh, to, to propose a total ban? Uh, they refer to international migration of water birds. There's about 5.5 million water birds moving into the Netherlands each year. Uh, national migration, which many of the better, the, the, the better term is national movements. So each day you can have about 1 million birds moving from feeding to roosting grounds. Um, they refer to the research on disturbance. There is no evidence for significant disturbance as, as, as a result of hunting in comparison to um, other activities. They could refer to a previous no hunting period uh, where there was no evidence uh, that, that this reduced bird movements. Um, and their approach was successful in that uh, they managed to maintain uh, some of their hunting activities, but they still had a restriction uh, in many areas on, on, on water birds. Uh, there was a similar proposal in Bulgaria by the Food and Veterinary Agency. Um, it was a proposal for, 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 for 20 days of the hunting season to be restricted. It ended up only being two days. Um, now, Bulgaria was a particular issue because there, there, were, there, were, there were a lot of regions that had issues with poultry outbreaks of avian influenza. And they discussed this pragmatically. They have a, a hunting board to advise the agriculture ministry. Uh, and and they, they came to a more, uh, a more logical approach to this. Uh, again, there was no evidence to suggest that hunting could play a role in spreading this. I'm going to come back to one important point, that hunters play a very important role in surveillance. Um, in Ireland as well, uh, we, we, we provided some advice. Uh, this is uh, wording from the Agricultural Ministry, uh, and they made reference to um, uh, a commission directive. Um, and we advised them... Uh, it states European legislation requires all shooting to be banned within a 10 kilometer uh, of a finding of, of, of an outbreak of avian influenza. Uh, and we stress the need, this has to be based on the establishment of control and monitoring areas, which is in line with, uh, uh, with the European Commission decisions on this. To conclude, the main point, uh, hunters can play a very important role and do play a very important role in surveillance and monitor, monitoring. We say they are the, the, the eyes and the ears of the countryside. We see their importance with regard to African swine fever and wild boar. They're in places that other uh, uh, users are not. Um, so it's much better to have them out there uh, playing an important role in surveillance. Uh, we need to continue promoting awareness, and certainly you see a lot of national hunting associations are always encouraging their members to follow updates on avian influenza very carefully. Uh, there's a range of biosecurity measures proposed. You will see these on many websites in terms of handling game, in terms of cooking game, in terms of reporting game, etc. I think FACE and CIC, we need to continue advising our members, and in particular uh, the Scientific Task Force on Avian Influenza. Uh, I think we were unsuccessful this time uh, to get, uh, we'll say, more pragmatic wording around the topic of disturbance, uh, but I think we can improve this in the future. And we also need a better understanding uh, of, of, of this virus. Again, there has been a whole range of accusations made around wild birds, but these haven't been backed up by a solid uh, evidence base yet. Uh, and there is no consensus yet within the scientific community, so we really need to have a better understanding uh, of, 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 of wild birds. And that then leads to approaches, uh, in particular approaches to restricting or not activities like hunting. Um, 
And again, the main uh, consensus is, and all of the evidence uh, is, 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 is pointing to and linked to uh, the poultry sector, poor biosecurity conditions, uh, and uh, trade and transport. And again, we need to continue focusing on this term uh, of disturbance. Um, it's a very important that, that uh, hunters are out there in the field uh, playing this role in surveillance um, and we're certainly not in favour of unjustified, unscientific proposals to restrict hunting. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. And that's it for another two weeks. That's the last you'll hear from the CIC. And uh, we will maybe see if we can go again next year. Hopefully there'll be some more people there. And uh, we'll try and record more of our own audio ourselves. Yeah, I'm going to try and stay for longer. I had to leave before a lot of the people um, spoke in the days after, but uh, I think it worked all right. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm pretty sure that the next podcast you will be hearing from us will be with uh, Chris Conroy, uh, who is the, uh, he heads up the the science part of the Nest Fishery Board. Uh, and he's a really interesting guy. He was on the news uh, with me actually last week talking about uh, Pacific salmon in our rivers and of all the Facebook pages of all the fisheries boards in it's Scotland the best. it is the by yeah. far the best but we, we were actually fortunate to spend a little bit of time with him and what he does uh, to make that Facebook page very good and you know he spends a lot of his time not a lot of his time but he, he, I think he does a lot of I it think in his does. spare time <laughs> actually does, yeah. um, in his evenings and that and he puts GoPros underwater like four of them so it covers all angles and uh, he gets amazing footage of the salmon and trout and everything sea trout coming up the river it's absolutely spectacular it was, without a doubt the best Facebook page uh, for fishing there is because he actually proves there's fish in the river yeah if you want to be enthused by fresh fish coming into the river go and check uh the i think it's the loch ness and district fishery board uh, page just in, loch ness a, in scientific it. terms it must be amazing to have that kind of documentation of underwater footage though for a river yeah if, but, and but, they, they they've been you can see if disease is coming up the river yeah, you can see and he did yeah. actually uh the last video i think he put up you could see a little bit of fungus on the nose of one of the fish oh, they and they're doing some really cool projects right now as well to help I th the I migration think, I, think, I think a lot of it's actually funding because when he we spoke to him i mean he will probably tell us all this you know i think three of those gopros were donated yeah yeah well, and was one it? was his own personal mm. one so i think uh, a lot of these you know he's doing amazing work but donated by kind people i think a fisherman was one another guy that worked there was yeah. donated i think his. they did it buy one, one. I think yeah they, they bought one, one. Uh, but he, uh, we've got him teed up for the podcast. He's just trying to tackle one of the biggest problems with living in a rural community, which is terrible, terrible broadband. So I, when I spoke to him last uh, a couple of days ago, he was going to go to um, the University of the Highlands and Island campus, wherever that must be in Inverness, I guess, and see if he could use their internet to be able to speak to us on Skype. <laughs> so right, I'm sure they've told him it's coming soon, fiber optic. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I think that's who we're going to be hearing from next. It's going to be a really interesting podcast, um, and he's a great guy. If you want to get a, a little inkling into what he's like, then go and have a look on our podcast Facebook page and just scroll down until you find the link to the news uh, that was out on STV from a week ago. Don't forget that this podcast is supported by the Scottish Association for Country Sports. 